So the Azerbaijanis and the Armenians are still at war against each other, fighting over Nagorno-Karabakh. And supposedly the two sides have agreed to stop killing civilians. But given the fact that there <laughs> there have already been three um, uh, ceasefires that have been broken already, I'm not really putting too much faith in that. Uh, there was one ceasefire. They broke that, and then there was another ceasefire agreement that was broken, and then there was a uh, Trump administration brokered ceasefire, and that was also broken as well. So I'm not putting really uh, a whole lot of faith in much of anything when it comes to these sorts of ethnic conflicts. The conflict, the tribal conflict between the Azeris and the Armenians can be traced back to the Soviet Union. Um, Stalin wanted to make a compromise with the, uh, with the Turks. And so he said, well, Nagorno-Karabakh will go to, uh, to Azerbaijan. And this was a part of a compromise with Turkey. And so the Armenians have uh, disagreed over this since then. And, uh, in the late 1980s, when it was quite obvious that the Soviet Union was about to tumble down, uh, the Armenians and the Azeris tried, supposedly, to work out their tensions over this territory. And then, well, by the early 1990s, they just broke out fighting and started killing each other in a very, very brutal war in which tens of thousands of people died, both soldiers and civilians. I think the number was around 30 or 35,000 um, people dead. It was pretty, pretty horrendous. But in the 1990s, there were a lot of conflicts like that that were taking place. Uh, you had the um, Serbs versus everyone else in the Balkans, with the exception of Montenegro. And then also in the 1990s, you had the war between the Russians and the Dagestanis and the Russians and the Chechens. That was also in the 1990s. And it all... And, that also took place in the Caucasus, in North Caucasus, but nonetheless, it's still the Caucasus, or the Caucasus, as they call them. Um, so, looking at this whole situation, what do we see? Well, the Russian government just said that if, if fighting ever boils over into mainland Armenia, Russia will get involved in the conflict. Because... The fighting right now is pretty much being localized to Nagorno-Karabakh, which technically is a part of Azerbaijan, officially is a part of Azerbaijan. The Armenians say otherwise. They say, no, no, Azerbaijan, Nagorno-Karabakh belongs to uh, Armenia because it's inhabited mainly by ethnic Armenians. Um, but the fighting nonetheless is pretty much confined within Nagorno-Karabakh. And as long as the fighting takes place within that region, technically it's within Azerbaijan, and Russia has no obligation to defend Azerbaijan. But there is a security agreement that was made between the Russians and the Armenians in which if the Armenians ever get attacked, Russia would have to uh, intervene. And the, part of this agreement is that, well, there are other countries that have also... Um, uh, become a part of this pact. Uh, Belarus is a part of it. I'm not, I don't remember the other countries, but I think they're pretty much all Eastern European or, yeah, Eastern European or, you know, strong allies of Russia. But nonetheless, there is this security agreement between the Russians and the Armenians that says, well, it's kind of like NATO. If one country gets attacked, the other NATO countries have to defend that country. So if Armenia gets attacked, whereby, you know, the Azeris military enters Armenia, maybe decides to invade Yerevan or something to the likes of that, Russia would have to get involved. So if the fighting boils over, Russia very likely will get involved. And um, in that type of a situation, it would be uh, essentially a conflict between Russia and Turkey, much like what's been taking place in Syria. Um, in one of my uh, recent videos, I talked about how Russia and Turkey are essentially fighting over Syria. Uh, in the Idlib province, the, um, uh, the Russian Air Force did an airstrike, killing dozens of uh, Turkish-backed Syrian rebels. 
And then back in February of 2020, Russia slaughtered, Russia and the Syrian military, slaughtered uh, 33 or so Turkish soldiers. It, that was an act of war. So the Turks and the Russians are fighting over Syria. If the conflict in the South, uh, South Caucasus in, in, um, you know, between Armenia and Azerbaijan escalates to the point where fighting boils over into mainland Armenia, Russia would have to get involved. Because at that point, uh, Turkey would be invading um, an ally of the Russians. Because Russia is providing weapons to the Azerbaijanis. That's a fact. Russia wants to make money off of the conflict. It's just like the United States. The Americans do the same exact thing. They'll give weapons to both sides. Great example, the, um, when the Iraqis and the Iranians were at war, um, Saddam Hussein was our guy, but we were also selling weapons to the Iranians. So war is a very, very tragic business. Um, nonetheless, though, Azerbaijan is considered a strategic ally, a strategic partner with Russia. Uh, Armenia is considered an ally. And remember, we have to go back to World War I. World War I is so significant because World War I essentially gives us the almost like a blueprint of the modern world and how things function within the world of tensions and conflicts and tribal animosities and, and regional animosities and national animosities. World War II essentially was a continuation of World War I. The Germans were backing the Bosnians in World War I. They did the same exact thing in World War II. Uh, you go back to World War I, the Russians and the Turks fought over Armenia. Go look up the battle that was waged between the Russians and the Turks. And in those days, they were considered Ottomans, but they're the same people today. Um, go look at the battle that was waged between the Ottomans and the Russians over the area of Vaughn. Vaughn was an Armenian region that was fought over by the Russians and the Turks, and it was vicious. It was absolutely bloody. Um, days and days, weeks and weeks and weeks, numerous weeks of endless fighting, going back and forth on, you know, who was uh, controlling the territory at one point in time, and then the other side would come and take the territory back. It was really, really vicious. But the, the Russians and the Turks, and Russia at that time was under the Tsar, so I'm not talking about Bolshevik Russia, I'm talking about Tsarist Russia, very, very different. Um, Russia and the Turks viciously fought over Armenia because the Russians wanted to m make sure that their empire was established in the Caucasus. Now, when the Bolsheviks took over, the Bolsheviks were like, we don't give a damn about any of this stuff. And they, the Bolsheviks essentially were a satellite for the Germans. The Germans wanted to knock the Russians out of the war. So the Germans provided a ton of gold to Vladimir Lenin, financed his revolution, and um, made sure that the, uh, the um, Marxists took over the Russian government. And once they got rid of the... the uh, the established government at that time, because it wasn't under the Tsar. They already threw the Tsar out, and then there was a transitional government that was controlling Russia. Then the Germans backed the Marxists, and Vladimir Lenin led his revolution of the peasant class, and they took over the, the Russian state. Um, once that took place, because part of the deal between the Russians and the Marxists was that, well, once the Marxists took over, they'll pull Russia out of the war. And so once the, the Bolsheviks took over, they gave the Germans and their allies a whole bunch of territory. The Germans were like, hey, you know, give us Ukraine. Bolsheviks were like, here you go. The, Bolshev the uh, Germans carved out Ukraine from Russia. That's why till this day, to this day, the Ukrainians are a puppet state for the European Union, puppet state for NATO, puppet state for the Germans. It's why when the Russians invaded Ukraine, the the Germans were back in the uh, the Ukrainians and NATO was back in the bunch of Nazi murderers, the Azov Battalion. Um, 
but the Germans got Ukraine, and then the Ottomans said, hey, give us this giant chunk of Armenia, and then here you go, you can have it. Give us this giant chunk of Azerbaijan, okay, fine. But the Bolsheviks wanted Baku. Ottomans were like, no, 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 we're gonna get Baku too. You're giving us Baku, because Baku was a huge, Baku was essentially a giant oil field. It's one of the biggest oil fields on earth. And so there was a battle between the Bolshevik Russians and the Ottomans, and the Ottomans won. The Ottomans took Baku from the, from the Bolsheviks. So even, even when the Bolsheviks were running Russia, there was still conflict between the, the Bolsheviks and the Ottomans. Not as much as when the Tsar was controlling Russia, but nonetheless, there was conflict. They fought over Baku, and the, the Ottomans won. So the Ottomans historically wanted to control um, uh, the South Caucasus, Today is no different because if, if that wasn't the case, then why is Turkey strongly supporting Azerbaijan? What we are currently seeing is a transition. We are seeing a transition into a very, very dark era. There was um, a video that leaked out recently uh, from Azerbaijan. And it showed... Um, Azeri soldiers uh, executing two uh, Armenians. Uh, it was uh, a 71-year-old Armenian man and an, an Armenian soldier. The 71-year-old Armenian man, I believe his name was Benik, uh, Benik Jacobian, if I'm not mistaken, or Hakobian, I think his name was. It was really, really horrific. Um, I didn't watch the video, but I read a description of it. I don't want to watch these things. Um, I used to watch videos like that, and it's just, it, it's depressing. But they push this old man to the ground, and they execute him, they shoot him in cold blood like that. It was just really, really horrific. And then, just a number of days ago, there was a photo that went around the internet uh, showing an Aziri soldier holding up the decapitated head of an Armenian soldier. It's really horrific stuff. And so this war is only going to get bloodier. I don't see this war... Um, subsiding anytime soon. Uh, there have been three ceasefires so far, and every one of them has been broken. Um, they had a horrific war back in the 1990s in which tens of thousands were killed. So I don't see, I don't see these people being nice to each other anytime soon. Turkey is exasperating this conflict. Uh, Bashar al-Assad said it quite clearly that Turkey is the one behind this conflict. Remember how this conflict began? Uh, they began to, from what I have, from what I read, Azerbaijan fired on the Armenians, and I suspect, I suspect, that it was Turkey who told the Azeris to do this. Turkey wants a war, and Turkey is known to instigate wars. Uh, without provocation. Um, for example, there's a great example of this that was reported not too long ago. Uh, it was actually leaked out that the Turks were planning on actually murdering random Syrian soldiers in order to provoke a war between Turkey and Syria. The plan was squashed because there were some people within the Turkish government who had enough sense to stop it. But this information was leaked out. Also, um, back in 2014, there was a little Armenian town um, that sits right on the border between Syria and, uh, and Turkey. It's called Kesab. And there was a horrific massacre that took place. Uh, a bunch of Muslim Mujahideen fanatics went into that village and killed over 70 Armenian people, Christians. And these were, these were Turkey's guys. Turkey wants to see Armenian blood. There is a horrendous tribal hatred that exists between these two peoples. Um, the Turks want to resume from where they left off back in World War I. Here's the thing that people need to understand when it comes to these sorts of things. You can look at this conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan, and you can say, well, these people have always hated each other, so who cares? Who cares, right? Well, you can have that position, and I'm, and I'm going to assume that most people would have that position. 
but you would be uh, inadequate to have such a position because at one point in time, Americans didn't really consider Syria that significant. Nobody cared about Syria. It's some poor Middle Eastern country somewhere in the hicks of the Near East where Abraham once walked the earth. But now Syria is very significant. To the point now where Turkey and Russia are fighting over it. Turkey and Russia are in conflict over this country. Um... Now, you could say, well, this conflict between the Azeris and the Armenians is, in, is, is insignificant. Well, back in the 1990s, you could have said the same thing. You could have said, well, you know, these people are fighting each other, so who cares? But now they're fighting each other again. Now they're fighting each other again. You could have said the same thing in the 1990s about the Yugoslav conflicts between the Serbs and the Croats, Serbs and the Bosnians, Serbs and the Albanians. Uh, you could have said the same thing. Well, you know, these people are killing each other, so who cares? That was back in the 1990s but the hatred still exists today. And I could point to World War I. You could see the conflict in World War I. The Serbs versus the Germans, the Serbs versus the, Aust the Austrians, the Serbs versus the Bosnians. You see the same thing in World War II. You see the same thing in the 1990s. What do you have to understand? To those of you who just look at these conflicts and say, oh, they're insignificant, what you need to understand is that these conflicts that we see today are simply the continuation of the same thing that, have been, that has been going on for a very long time, sometimes going back centuries. And eventually they erupt into, into eventually they are a part, they, they become a part of a ripple effect that uh, eventually amalgamates into something bigger, which escalates into a, glo a global conflict. Great example, Serbs versus Austro-Hungarians, right? The Austro-Hungarians wanted to annex Bosnia because, well, you know, Holy Roman Empire. We want to have our empire. Holy Roman Empire lasted for <laughs> centuries and centuries and centuries. Serbs said no to hell with you, and then there was uh, a revolution. The, the Serbian nationalist, uh, Mr. Uh, Gavrilo Princip, shot dead the Archduke Ferdinand and his wife, killed both of them. With a pistol, boom, boom, right in their car. Oh, nobody gave a damn. Nobody cared. And then there was a conflict between the Austrians and the Serbs. And the, the Germans and the Austrians, they made it out as if, well, this is just going to be a local conflict. We're going to keep this within the confines of the Balkans. Don't worry about it, guys. And most people didn't worry about it. Most people didn't give a damn. But eventually that conflict became a global conflict, World War I. It rippled effect. You look at the situation between the Azeris and the Armenians, you got the Turks being extremely involved. Now, the Turks did have some involvement in the Azeri-Armenian War back in the, in the 1990s, but it wasn't as deep as this. Today, we see it, we see Turkey getting, getting so engaged in this conflict, it's become to the point where a Turkish uh, F-16 shot down an Armenian fighter jet. Turkey is directly involved in this conflict because Turkey wants to control the Caucasus. Turkey right now is also under the uh, an immense amount of influence from the Neo-Ottomans. They want to revive the Ottoman Empire. We are seeing a, a stage in Turkey's post-World War I history that we haven't seen in a very long time. Turkey, for the first time, is becoming extremely and substantially involved in expansionism in the Eastern Mediterranean, in Northern Syria, in Libya, in the... Uh, even as far as uh, Crimea, where you have the Tatar, you know, Muslim Turkic peoples connecting with the Turks. Turkey wants to not only revive its own empire, but Turkey also is fanatical about a philosophy called Eurasianism. Turkey wants to control the Eurasian world because Turkey is not just a Muslim country. Turkey is also a racist country. And Tur Turkey is one of the most racist countries in the world. Um, Turkey believes in creating a, a global power of Turks, yeah. Central Asians, Crimean Tatars, those types of people. So Turkey is, is heavily involved in a form of expansionism that we haven't seen in a very, very long time in the post-World War world, uh, you know, since the fall of the Ottoman Empire is what I mean. Um, 
so it's very different this time. It's very different this time. And the Russians are also getting involved heavily in, in expanding their hegemony as well. And so if the Russians and the Turks want to both revive their empires, they are going to clash. It is inevitable. It's absolutely inevitable. So you have Turkey in Azerbaijan, specifically in Nagorno-Karabakh. If fighting spills over into Armenia, supposedly Russia is under an agreement that it has to intervene. You could see a war between the Turks and the Russians in the Caucasus. Um, if that happens, Ukraine, what's Ukraine going to do? Ukraine isn't too far away. The distance between Ukraine and the, uh, the Caucasus is about the distance between Texas and Florida. That's not too far away. So what happened in the, in the 1990s when the Azeris and the Armenians were killing each other? Ukrainian right-wing paramilitaries entered the conflict. So Ukraine is going to be very, very worried and filled with consternation about that. Um, the EU will get involved. The, the EU will have to get involved because the Caucasus is very, very close to Europe, right near Ukraine. From you know, right once you're in Ukraine, you're in Europe. You're right there in Europe. Um, Turkey and Russia are not that far away from each other either. You look at a map. There's Georgia, Azerbaijan, Turkey. There's Armenia. They're right. There's Russia. They're right across from each other. Um, they're Black Sea, Caspian Sea neighbors. Um, and then you also have the situation in North Africa. You have the situation in the Middle East. You have also the fact that Russia is cr controlling Crimea. Who inhabits Crimea? Muslim, Crimean, Tatar, Turks, who are very favorable towards Erdogan. Um... Erdogan wants to use those Crimean Turks as proxies against the Russians. So what we are seeing right now, and we've been seeing this for decades, we, we've been seeing this since the 1990s, when the Yugoslav War took place, when the war between the Azeris and the Armenians took place, when the wars between the Russians and the Dagestanis and the Russians and the Chechens took place. We are seeing, and we are currently living in a transition towards another global conflict. You had World War One. Not too long after World War One, you had World War Two. You know, it was in the early 1930s when Japan invaded China. Didn't take that long for World War Two to begin. And then uh, you had, um, well, supposedly peace, right? After World War Two, we're not. This is not going to happen ever again. We're going to form the European Union. Well, in the 1990s, just what, 40-something years after World War II, war broke out in the Balkans. And what did we see in the 1990s in the Balkan conflict? We saw the revival of German power. Very few people have made a note of this. Um, I would say one of the intellects who has written a lot on this subject is Noam Chomsky. There are a lot of Serbian intellects also. There's uh, one particular German writer who has written on this. I don't remember his name. But there have been a number of, of scholars and, and geopoliticists who have written on this. It's not something that I've conspired or made up. We saw the revival of German power in the 1990s. Um, it was the Germans who really were involved, um, at one point in time more so than the Americans, in instigating um, conflict between the Croats and the Serbs, especially the Albanians and the Serbs as well. Um, the, the KLA, the Kosovo Liberation Army, was practically an invention of Germany. If you look at the KLA fighters, they're dressed up in German uniforms. Um, so we saw the revival of German power in the 1990s. We also saw the, a, a war break out between the Chechens and the Russians, and also the Dagestanis and the Russians. Now, who are the Dagestanis and who are the Chechens? These are people of the North Caucasus. In the South Caucasus, you have Azerbaijan, Armenia, Georgia. In the North Caucasus, you have um, Dagestan, Chechnya, Ingushetia. Uh, you have South Ossetia, Abkhazia. You have these kind. There's probably, I think, one or two that I forgot in there, but you have these countries. This is the North Caucasus, and these people are... Well, is South Ossetia part of North Caucasus? I'm not entirely sure. Actually, I don't think so. I'm not entirely sure about South Ossetia. Correct me if I'm wrong about South Ossetia. But Ingushetia, Chechnya, Dagestan, 
these countries are part of the North Caucasus. And these country, these regions, sorry, they're not countries, these regions are controlled by Russia. They are provinces of the Russian Federation. In the 1990s, the fact that Dagestan was invaded by Chechnya and the fact that Chechnya at one point in time had its entire parliament taken over by Islamists and at one point in time, Chechnya was, li was literally under Sharia law. A province of the Russian Federation was literally under Sharia law. And the fact that Russia had to start a war with Chechnya and Dagestan to end this really shows that the Russian Federation isn't, in this context, the Russian Federation isn't as united. It, it would be like Louisiana starting an uprising because they want to create like an ethnic French state or something and America having a full out war with, with Louisiana. It's like, it would prove that America really isn't that united. The Russian Federation isn't as united in this type of context. And it really, in the 1990s, it really indicated that Russia has a struggle to control the South, the North Caucasus. So Russia is very interested in controlling the Caucasus. It has an interest in controlling the Caucasus. Now Russia doesn't control the South Caucasus. But Turkey controls one country of the South Caucasus, and that is Azerbaijan. So Turkey already has uh, kind of a, an advantage in, in the conflict over that area. Now, Russia has a couple of uh, satellite states in the, um, in the South Caucasus. It has uh, Abkhazia, and it also has South Ossetia. And these are two regions that are actually a part of Georgia officially, but they are self-proclaimed republics that are loyal to Russia. This was the whole, this was what the whole thing was over during the 2008 conflict between Georgia and Russia. Um, so Russia also wants to control the South Caucasus and that was made very, very obvious in the Georgian-Russian conflict. All of these little conflicts that we've been seeing in these decades, 1990s, early 2000s, the Iraq war, the Syrian civil war, all these conflicts are really steps towards the global conflict that we are heading towards. Because when you look at World War I, it started out as an ethnic conflict in the Balkans. And there were all sorts of, the ethnic tensions that we saw in the Balkans in the 1990s, they were alive and well during World War I. They were alive and well during World War II. That's why the Nazis backed the Albanians and the Bosnians and the Croats, the Croatian fascists, and they slaughtered a million or so Serbs. 1990s, what did the Germans do? They backed the Croats, they backed the Bosnians, they backed the damn Albanians. It's the same thing. Nothing has changed, my friends. Nothing has changed. Bottom line, I've talked way too long on this video. Okay, you guys just heard some theology. God bless.